All right, we're good. Please start. Welcome, as always. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm Greg Dennis, Policy Director for Voter Choice Massachusetts. In my day job, I'm a software engineer. Um, this is my passion volunteer, one of my volunteer activities outside. Um, I have some connections, some people in the room, Steve and I are neighbors, and we're both elected town meeting members from the same precinct in Arlington. First elected the same year, and this was seven years ago. And uh, Jamie, when you first ran for treasurer, I don't know if you remember, but I think I designed your website um, 20 years ago. <laughs> or I had, a, I had a hand in designing it. Um, you certainly helped, thank you. Yeah. So, um, all right, so I'm just gonna briefly review what ranked choice voting is. This will probably be you know, common for some of you, uh, but because we're approaching Halloween, I'm gonna use our candy example. And ranked choice voting eliminates this common problem of vote splitting. Um, so let's say we're holding an election for favorite candy and there are two candidates in the race, Reese's peanut butter cups and candy corn. And early voting shows about 60% of uh, the voters prefer Reese's to candy corn. Hope this is animating and showing you the transitions here. Looks good. All right. And so it looks like peanut butter cups will win handily. That is until, uh-oh, third candidate decides to enter the race. Reese's minis. Uh, and that's bad news for Reese's fans. Now their vote is split. Uh, and on election day, candy corn wins with less than a majority of the vote, less than 50%. Now with ranked choice voting, uh, we aim to fix that situation, go forward. Uh, voters are allowed to mark, they're given a ranked ballot like this, they're allowed to mark just their first choice as they would today. And if they want a second choice in the second column, a third choice in the third column, as many or as few choices as they like. And to count the votes, we start by counting just those first choices. Uh, just those just those choices in the first column. And if we count just the choices in the first column, replaying this election with ranked choice, we'll see again that Reese's has is the first choice of 35% of voters. Candy corn is the first choice of 40%. And Reese's mini is 25. Uh, but under ranked choice, it's not sufficient to win with merely 40% of the vote. You need a majority. And if you don't have majority, then the last place candidate here, that's Reese's Minis, is eliminated. And in this simplistic example, we're going to assume that everybody that voted for the Reese's Minis first voted for the peanut butter cup second. And every vote for the eliminated candidate um, goes to, instead counts for, um, the second choice on that voter's ballot. So now Reese's Peanut Butter Cups uh, is in the lead with 60 to 40 and has a majority of the vote and wins the ranked choice voting election. All right, so this was all about candy, but how does this impact uh, politics and uh, parties that are not one of the two major parties like the Pirate Party? Well, this was uh, discussed um, and presented pretty eloquently in this essay um, by Pirate Party, former Pirate Party leader, Andrew Katech Norton in his essay, Breaking the Two-Party Two-Step where he talks about what's referred to in the essay as the wasted vote syndrome. And he writes, one of the most common claims is that voting for a third party candidate is a quote, wasted vote. It has led to the rise of tactical voting in the US where instead of voting for the person they want, we have people voting for the big two representative they dislike the least. The main reason they, they being the third party, minor party candidates won't win is not because people don't support them, but due to tactical voting, people are too afraid to be on the losing side. Okay, so what are, let's look concretely at some of the effects of this wasted vote syndrome and what it means for parties that are not either of the two major parties. Well, the first thing it means is fewer votes. I'm taking, I'm going to take some presidential examples here. So in 1992, Ross Perot ran as a Reform Party candidate. He was polling in advance of the election at 39% of the vote, so very substantial. And on election day, he got 19% of the vote. So more than half his voters um, thereabouts got cold feet on election day and ended up casting their vote for one of the two major party candidates. Ralph Nader in 2000 was polling in advance at 6%, sometimes as high as 7%. And on election day wound up with um, just under 3% of the vote. Again, more than half 
his voters getting cold feet on election day and not voting for him. And Gary Johnson in 2016 polling up at 9% and winding up on election day with 3% um, because of this wasted vote fear that, um, at least in these cases, more than half these supporters of uh, non major party candidates had. Another effect is fewer candidates deciding to run under uh, minor party labels. I, showing here the example of Bernie Sanders, who ran as an independent when he ran for mayor of Burlington, when he ran for Congress, when he ran for Senate, but decided for president um, that he was going to run within the Democratic Party structure within their primary. And when asked why, he said, well, what I did not want to do is run as a third party candidate, take votes away from the Democratic candidate and help elect some right wing Republican. I did not want responsibility for that. We could also look at the example of, say, Ron Paul, who might feel more ideologically comfortable in the Libertarian Party, but deciding to run within the Republican Party primary in their structure. Uh, another downside is that it narrows the media coverage to just how these candidates affect the two major party candidates. These are some headlines from the past two, um, past two presidential elections, how Gary Johnson and Jill Stein help elect Donald Trump, or the Green Party spoil the midterms for Democrats and so on. Uh, so the media coverage for third party candidates is narrowed to just their effect on the sort of horse race between the top two candidates and very, very few, very hard to find articles that actually cover what do these candidates stand for? What, what issues? What are their issues? What's their platform? Um, that basically receives, you know, next to no coverage. And instead, it's the focus on this spoiler issue and this wasted vote issue. Uh, and another effect, the fourth effect I have here, is fewer debate, debate invitations. The major party candidates often apply pressure to keep minor party candidates out of the debates. Um, as much as you know, candidates are able to do online nowadays and getting their name out and, and getting recognition that way and through social media, there are still millions of voters that rely upon tele television and televised debates and televised just television exposure generally to know who the candidates are. And that gives them a sense of legitimacy, particularly being on the same debate stage. And I have a few quotes here from uh, people that ran the Commission on Presidential Debates about why they've kept independent candidates out um, ever since Ross Perot got on the debate stage. And David Norcross here says, I think extra candidates just end up being tools for one of the two. So I don't like the idea. And Alan Simpson saying, uh, non eloquently. <laughs> it's obvious that independent candidates mess things up. So, um, this is just to give you some of the mindset. And, you know, if you know the Commission on Presidential Debates, it's, bas it's basically run by the two parties to control who's allowed into their debates. But it gives you some insight into the mindset of people in the parties and the role that minor party candidates could have in screwing things up, so to speak, or messing things up for. The major party candidates, and um, so what? Do, what do we have here? Um, so, without ranked choice voting in place, we have a system in which minor party candidates are deprived of votes. They're deprived of candidates in some cases. They're deprived of higher quality media coverage, and they're deprived of debate invitations. And this spurs has an effect of sort of a cycle of delegitimacy that's hard to break out of. And we're trying to break out of the, one of the way, tools we hope will help break out of this is ranked choice voting to undo this, to liberate voters, to vote their conscience, to spur more candidates to run under minor party labels, uh, to widen the media coverage of third party candidates and to make it more likely they'll be invited to debates. Um, I don't wanna oversell it, you know, it's not a panacea a lot of this sort of wasted vote mentality is culturally, psychologically ingrained in some way. Um, and it's not going to happen overnight, but I think it does, it, it would be a significant step toward chipping away at these factors. And that's what we're trying to do at Voter Choice Massachusetts. Um, how are we trying to do that? Well, let me give, start by just giving you some history of the organization. So in 2016, um, 
when Maine won ranked choice voting at the ballot in 2016, um, a number of people in Massachusetts, myself included, were volunteering by making phone calls remotely, some of us by traveling up to Maine to help win that ballot question. And when Maine won ranked choice voting, we said, well, if it can happen in Maine, why not in Massachusetts too? And so those volunteers um, got together and formed VCMA, Voter Choice Massachusetts, to try to make it happen here. Uh, in 2017, um, our testimony to the Charter Review Commission of the, at the time, the town of Amherst, now the city of Amherst, convinced them to include ranked choice voting in their new recommended charter. Uh, in 2019, we helped win ranked choice voting on the ballot in East Hampton, Massachusetts. As you probably know, in 2020, uh, some people um, involved in our organization helped create the ballot question campaign. You may remember as the Yes on Two campaign in 2020, um, that obviously did not work out the way we wanted. There are many reasons for that loss, a key one being that the pandemic put a real cramp in our ability to educate and get the word out about ranked choice. One of the keys to the main campaign was meeting voters in person at all these little events, mock elections, beer elections, things like that, meeting voters one-on-one -on -one and teaching them how it worked. And we had a plan to do the same thing. And then when the pandemic hit, we just were not able to do that. But we need to remember we didn't, we didn't lose anything in that we didn't have ranked choice voting before, we didn't have ranked choice voting afterwards. Uh, and we wound up in a position where at least a lot more people in the state knew what it was. And also that same year, Alaska did win ranked choice voting statewide and uh, some other uh, ranked choice voting, um, cities and towns won ranked choice voting at the ballot. So it was still moving forward as a reform nationwide. Uh, so we got right back up in, in the time since, since we've really just been accelerating our efforts to bring ranked choice voting to more cities and towns in Massachusetts. In 2021, um, as Steve will surely remember, uh, we won ranked choice voting um, at Arlington Town Meeting. We won a home rule petition for it, and we sent that home rule petition to the legislature. And we also got to see East Hampton, again, which we had won at the ballot in 2019, they held their first ranked choice voting election in 2021. And in 2022, in this year, uh, we helped uh, win uh, ranked choice voting home rule legislation, uh, pass ranked choice voting home rule legislation through the C Northampton City Council and through Concord Town Meeting, and now those are before the legislature. And so that's really, you know, been the story of our activities in the time since 2020. Uh, the ballot question campaign, while it fell short, prompted a surge of interest in ranked choice voting around the state. And we've been translating that interest into efforts and campaigns to adopt RCV for local city and town elections. And uh, these local implementations of ranked choice are critical. Uh, they're important first because they improve the quality of municipal elections. And second, because local implementations help make the case for statewide implementation. Now, the primary argument that we, we still hear against ranked choice voting, although it's becoming weaker and weaker with each implementation, is that it's too complicated. And that's a myth. Uh, the, the surefire way to dispel that myth is to let voters actually use it, because when they use it, they realize it's not complicated. And that's a key role that these local implementations play. They normalize ranking, they prove that voters can handle it. And so city by city, town by town, we're moving Massachusetts closer to statewide adoption. And that's been our strategy. We have a playbook that takes uh, cities and towns through um, at most six stages, depending upon the nature of the, how they're going to bring it about. Starting from a learning phase <clears throat> all the way through to implementation. Um, below each stage here, you see some of the cities and towns we're working with at that stage. Each city and town is different. Some are able to skip some of these steps. Others may have to repeat some steps, but this is roughly the process. Uh, so we teach cities and towns what the process looks like. We organize and find other supporters. We may establish, in some cases, cities and towns establish ranked choice voting committees or elector, like election reform committees to propose uh, propose adoption of ranked choice, or propose a particular propo 
put forward a particular proposal before the city council or town meeting. That may involve some lobbying of the select board of the city council. And if that home rule petition passed, then of the state legislature, there may be a ballot question campaign as there was in East Hampton. And finally, there's implementation. And we're trying to move these cities and towns through this process. That's what we're doing. And uh, we have various ways people can get involved from signing up on our mailing list. We have a petition you can sign. Um, we're collecting names on a per city and town basis. You can also make a financial donation and you can also talk to me about advocating for bringing ranked choice voting to your city and town. And that's, that's the story. That's what we've been up to. And I love to take any, you know, questions that people have uh, about it. So in terms of advocacy, do you have any trainings either online or in person where people can uh, learn learn how to advocate within their community? Yes, absolutely. When we've when somebody reaches out to us and says, I'd like to bring ranked choice voting to town X or city X, we say, okay, great. Let's have a meeting. We schedule a meeting with them where we walk them through our playbook. We say, step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. If you follow this playbook, this is gonna be your best chance for success. And we try not to you know, give them the whole process at once because it can be a little bit overwhelming. So we say, look, you just gotta focus on, you know, step one is sort of learn about your city and town government. You know, not everybody is fully you know, familiar with how it works. You know, how many, how many people are elected? What are their terms of office? You know, are they staggered terms or are they concurrent terms? How many at-large seats are there? How many district seats are there? And so on, just kind of get the sort of basics in place and your basic knowledge in place. And then they're like, step two is, okay, here's a list of people because we have a large list of people statewide that are supportive of ranked choice voting. Here's a list of people in your community we know support it. You know, the next step is help organize them into putting together a proposal. And here's some tips for organizing. So we, you know, handhold people through these steps and help these local activists be successful within their own community. We have a bunch of doc documentation and all kinds of tech tools to help them to help them. So, you know, we give them online document storage space. We have create a mailing list. We help them create a website if they want a website, help them host you know, video conferences, if they want that, we help them do, um, well, what else? We, we give them, we can help edit any materials they put together. We can help them print materials and so on. So we have a array of ways to help these local groups be successful. So I remember years ago when I was advocating for RCV, uh, one of the pushbacks was, uh, well, it's going to cost us money. We're going to need entirely new voting machines, and that's going to be such an exorbitant cost because we only buy them every 20 years or something like that. Although I think, I think before uh, the 2000 election, I don't know how old the punch card voting machines the city of Boston had, but um, what, how do you, how do you counter that message? That yeah. It's just going to be too expensive. Well, the good thing about the machines in particular is all modern voting machine, for the most part, all modern voting machines and all voting machines that are available for, that are authorized for purchase in Massachusetts today are compatible with ranked choice voting. If a community is going to buy a voting machine today, um, they have two choices. There's only two choices that are authorized. There's only been two choices for a long time, but what those two choices are have varied a little bit. Two particular vendors. Um, they both compatible, not only compatible with ranked choice voting, but used in ranked choice voting elections today. And the majority that actually now we're at I think roughly three fourths of cities and towns already have one of these two machines, already have voting machines that are compatible with ranked choice. And that wasn't true at all 20 years ago. So that conversation about voting machines and the need to buy new voting machines was much more difficult back then. Um, it's 
not a big issue today unless we're talking about one of these few communities that is still on this legacy equipment that they have were supposed to have replaced already for reasons unrelated to rank choice. It's too old, it breaks down, it's impossible to repair when it breaks down. So we're, we're at a point where the vast majority of season towns already have compatible equipment. And in some of these cases where somebody's come to us, uh, I think one of the most recent examples was Weymouth. Somebody from Weymouth came to us and said, we wanna bring rank choice voting to Weymouth. We said, okay, let's go look at your voting machines. Oh. You're one of the small minority that of communities that has these old voting machines that aren't compatible yet. Can you ask your clerk what, what's the schedule for replacing them? And she did that. She contacted the clerk, and the clerk said, "Oh, we've already authorized money for that. Uh, they'll be in place next year." So they're being so we're almost at the point, and we're getting rapidly there where 100 percent of the machines are compatible. So that's um, so the machine story isn't a huge factor today. In terms of other costs, if we're talking to a city, one of our main selling points to cities is they can eliminate their preliminary elections and have a single ranked choice voting election. You know, you live in Somerville, Jamie, and you know, if Somerville were to adopt a ranked choice and get rid of that September preliminary that has incredibly low turnout and have one ranked choice voting election in November, that can be, mean a net cost savings. There are maybe some costs around. Um, higher might be higher ballot printing costs um there might be um uh, there might be some additional software costs you might need a slightly newer version of the software you might need to purchase some software but those are that's uh fairly nominal so the price conversation is is much easier to have and, and much easier to win today and those are those are the optical scan and whatever um, non-optical scan, you know, display ones that are used for folks with disabilities and things like that. Correct? Yeah, I mean the the only machines that are authorized for actually doing the count are the optical scan machines. There's only two optical scan machines available for purchase. Um, every as you alluded to every precinct, every voting precinct in the state is required to have one ADA machine, ADA, American for Disability Act authorized machine that the way it's called a ballot marking device, you insert the ballot in and then it shows it on the screen. And then they have various ways for people with disabilities to mark their ballot um, that it marks onto the physical ballot you inserted. And then that physical ballot is fed through the same optical scan machine that the other ballots go through. So um, nothing. So that uh, that ADA device, that ballot marking device, um, is compatible with any optical scan ballot. So it's regardless of whether it's ranked choice or not, all it does is draw little bubbles. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Good to learn something new. So. Um, Obviously, as you said, you're focusing on uh, lower, you know, getting the message out, trying to convert as many cities and towns to using RCV. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say that while it's it's unfortunate that the RCV uh, initiative didn't win, it certainly did much better than the fusion voting uh, proposal that was put out years before. So is there a timeline for when you might bring it back to the statewide ballot, or are you still just going to focus as much as you can at things locally um, and build up enough of groundswell that you feel like you can win uh, next next time? Uh, that's something we're always thinking about in reevaluating that question. But the law says once you if you bring it statewide and it loses, you're not allowed to bring the same question back for six years. Uh, that would put sort of the earliest we could bring the exact same question back till till 2006, which isn't really, you know, all that far away. <laughs> when you think about the time, the timeline and advanced preparation you need for running a statewide campaign. Um, so the there have been people thinking about, well, is it possible to bring a modified proposal back before 2000, uh, sorry, I said 2006, I meant 2026. Um, 
Is it possible to bring a modified proposal back before 2026? That's it. Is some people looking at that legal question? Uh, I don't know if we would be prepared for that anyway, in terms of the sense of momentum and the sense of local implementation that we have. So, um, you know, I kind of think 2026 might be the soonest we would see it back in the statewide ballot. Um, it might be 2028, uh, but, you know, um, we're going to continue to reevaluate that. Ranked choice voting continues to grow across the country. It's making a lot of headlines in Alaska. Uh, it's on the ballot statewide in Nevada um, in next month. It's on the ballot in nine cities next month. So, um, and we have these home rule petitions before the legislature. So it's, it continues to pick up momentum and it continues to accelerate in popularity. So I don't know how that, what the sense is going to be. Um, for the time being, we're still very much focused on the local implementations and we're not preparing for a statewide run at this point. In, in 2020, what, what was your perception of who were the opponents? I, I mean, I know the both the <clears throat> the RCV uh, initiative certainly gained the largest amount of cont contributions, financial contributions. But who who were your opponents? What were their arguments? Um, is that something you'd, you'd want to cover? Just to like, what were the lessons learned from from that race? Besides the fact that no COVID and we need to get out, you know, get in front of voters more. Yeah. Um, so that was certainly one of the lessons. Uh, so the opponents tended to, there was this group called the Mask Fiscal, Mass Fiscal Alliance. You may know of as a, a very conservative group that um, been written in the multiple articles in the globe about um, there's sort of shadowy function in terms of who's donating to them. It's not clear who's donating to them. Um, and they were the opposition to the extent there was an opposite, to the extent there was an organized opposition. I really think, you know, when it comes to ballot question, the default position, and this is actually, you know, backed up by research, the default position of voters is no, right? No, I want the status quo. No, I don't understand this well enough. I just want the status quo. So our main opposition, I still feel, was just ignorance. It was just not enough people knowing what it was. I think you could see that, you know, this time around, you know, maybe with the dental insurance question, right? I think you might find a lot of people vote no on the dental insurance question, not because they've studied it and came to the conclusion that it's no, it's that I don't understand what this question is about. I don't know what it's asking me. <laughs> so I'm going to vote no because I just stick with the status quo. The devil I sort of know or just no change is better than some change I don't completely understand. So I, I, I just strongly feel that it's it was mostly ignorance. And that's backed up, you know, from a lot of anecdotes we've heard of people who just said, oh, I just didn't understand what it was. Um, and I didn't hear about it until I got to the ballot. Um, and in fact, if I had understood what it was, now that you're talking to me, I would have voted yes, but at the time I didn't know. <laughs> so, um, you know, just getting it out there in front of people. And I, I think the lack of local implementations, look at, you know, Maine got it statewide, but Maine got it statewide only after having it in Portland, Maine for Portland city elections for, um, how many years they got in Portland in 2011. So they had it in Portland for five years. And Portland, Maine is 5% of the population of Maine. That's a high percentage of the population subject to ranked choice voting um, and familiar with what it was and understanding that it's not this scary thing that they that is confusing. It's something they could handle. So getting more local implementations in place, teaching people one on one what it is. Also, our television ads were terrible. We had awful ads and we need to do a better job with televised ads, but um, there were reasons why they weren't better that had to do with scheduling and financing, but we have to have better ads the next time around. <laughs> Great. All right, well, thank you very, well, um, just to make sure, are there any other questions from our other participants? 
Seeing none, thank you so much for speaking with us, Greg. Uh, how how can pirates? How can the pirate party help you? We are supporters of RCV for for a, for a long time. So yeah, um, so please go to our website voterchoicema.org, um, and you know you can find ways to get involved in this in in these ways. Sign up for a mailing list. Sign the petition. If you want to bring ranked choice voting to your city or town, let us know. If you can make a financial contribution, please do. Great. That's Thanks it. so much. Thanks so much, Craig. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, so next up is uh, Mitch DeVillo uh, from the U.S. Pirate Party. Are you on there, Mitch? Mitch is uh, also from the Illinois Pirate Party and one of the founders of that party. All right, so we're having a bit of technical difficulties. Uh, we'll work through those. Uh, thanks again to Greg for showing up and talking with us about uh, voter choice MA and the state of RCV or ranked choice voting in Massachusetts. Uh, later on for our last segment at four o'clock, uh, we're going to have on privacy and free software with Mickey Metz, Chris Thompson and Keegan Rankin from Agaric, who is a, a really good software cooperative focusing on uh, software that uh, will help uh, different nonprofit groups as well, either in custom projects or improving their communications and other stuff like that. So while we do the technical difficulties, I guess we'll just, uh, uh, I will just ramble on. Um, so our previous session uh, was not recorded and that was a discussion about planning for 2023. Uh, we decided we're going to have another one of these uh, come January specifically, I believe the date we chose was January 21st. Uh, starting at noon, probably going for uh, about an hour or two hours, trying to keep it shorter. Uh, so if there's something you want to talk about, if there's a topic you feel that we as a party should discuss, uh, send us an email at info at masspirates.org. And, um, you know, you can, we'll start putting out pages where, how you can sign up to participate in that. Uh, previously, we did do for normally we would do a registration page, but um, it helps us to know who's going to be there. Uh, we may or may not do that. We may just give the link to folks um, directly. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, we want to encourage all members to participate. As always, you can find us at masspirates.org. Um, let's see. And so additionally, we talked. I'm sorry, Hello? I was going to come and support you here. Okay. Uh, we we're also talking about what our current plans are for this year and what, what changes we're going to make as far as, uh, when the meetings are going and what we're going to, like every other week, we're going to switch the meetings down to. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. As, as, as. Yes, as as we discussed, um, doing IRC well, no longer doing uh, IRC meetings. Instead, doing video meetings where we will record them, just as we're doing this using uh, Big Blue Button, and um, where you can go in either uh, you can use your phone 
uh, or you can go in from your computer or your mobile device. And then we would do that every two weeks. Uh, the next one would be next Thursday um, and uh, the 13th. And then every other week we would be on Discord, uh, the US Pirate Party Discord, which we'll put a link in the description, uh, such that you can just go in and it's a chat discussion and it's more brainstorming, uh, you know, just open discussion uh, about issues that we should deal with or uh, ways we can be successful, uh, events we should be at, whatever the free flowing discussion would be. But the official meetings would be every two weeks now instead of every week. And those would be recorded uh, as video meetings that we would then upload both to our YouTube channel and to some other repository. So I believe Mitch is trying to log in via the phone. The other thing that we were going to try and do more this year was more, more, be more active in our communities, um, more getting out there and try and do more the, the quarterly conferences as well as um, as well as just being much more active in the community, going door to door and knocking, campaigning, even if we're not running for office, just the fact that we're out there letting people know who we are. And speaking of offices, just a reminder, it is our elections for our pirate council. And if you would like to participate, throw your hat into the ring, um, be a volunteer who charts the direction of the pirate party um, and makes things happen, then please put your name in. We'll put a link in the description for that. Uh, you can also check us out at masspirates.org where there'll be information there, how you can sign up. The election will take place in November and uh, we'd appreciate anyone who wants to help us to go and um, put their name in. I mean, now's your chance to kick me out of the treasury. Well, that would free you up to run for local office, Joe. Yeah, among other things. And if certainly someone wanted to be captain, then, you know, I could run for local office or state office. We, as a as a PAC, um, by Office of Campaign and Political Finance rules, uh, can Joe, as treasurer, myself as chair, cannot run for any... Uh, state or local office. Uh, so, however, if you form a PAC as an incumbent legislature, legislator, then you can go and, of course, run for office. I guess the perks of power. So, <clears throat> um, but if you, anyone can run for federal office, thankfully. So if that's something you're interested in, you would need to gather you and your volunteers would need to gather over 2,000 signatures to get on the ballot. Thankfully, you have basically from the middle of February until the end of July to do that. Is that you, Mitch? Uh, yes, it is. I apologize about that. Uh, oh, no worries. No worries. So uh, without any further ado, uh, Mitch is going to talk about why pirate parties are the best choice for the everyman. And uh, of course, if you have any, you know, if anyone here uh, participating has any questions or comments, please do offer them. And with that, I will be quiet and let Minch speak. Hi, everyone. So just to introduce myself, my name is Mitch Davillo. I am the Swarm Care Manager for the United States Pirate Party, and I am the head of the Illinois Pirate Party. Uh, I went out of my way to suggest this comment specifically because this is something that I actually am a firm believer in and I'm a very strong advocate for it, is that I believe pirate parties are the representative of the common man, that we are the truest representative of a party that is for the people and by the people. Uh, when looking at the pirate party, uh, there is a distinct uniqueness uh, to pirate parties, not just here in the United States, but across the world to where when you see a pirate party, you don't have a set ideal of pirate party politics. There are shared ideals, absolutely. 
you see a uh, shared ideals, the big one being the copyright reform and patent reform. Uh, but when you're looking at pirate parties, you look at the locality of it. Uh, I look at the United States Pirate Party as perhaps the truest uh, representation of what the United States of America initially was and was supposed to be, and that is a group of people from different states united together under the uh, cloak of multiculturalism and unity and democracy. Uh, when you look at a pirate party like the one you guys all have in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Pirate Party is very much to the need of uh, someone from Massachusetts. I, the word Joe told me is masshole, but I'm not sure if that's an appropriate word to call you all. Uh, but it is truly for the for the, someone from Massachusetts. Uh, someone from Massachusetts can look at the Pirate Party and say, "Wow, the, they are focused on my need. They're focused on what is important to the people of Massachusetts." Well, it's still Pirate Party involved, it's still localized to the everyman, you get a feel for what a Pirate Party is to you. And the more localized you get, the more specific it gets. A Pirate Party from Massachusetts doesn't look like a Pirate Party from Illinois. However, the end goal is still what is the proven best for everybody? What is the thing that's going to bring the most net good? And that is the commonality of it. You're going to see a lot of pirates have differing opinions. You're going to see a lot of pirates have differing viewpoints. But we are a group of people who can still get together, not only look past the differences, but discuss the differences and actually come to common ground. Uh, I don't know of many parties where you see many parties that have almost stringent, you have to follow party doctrine, you have to follow party lines. We are more so a representation of a ever-growing, ever-changing uh, people. Uh, when looking at, like, um, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, I'm sorry. If, if anyone has a question while I regain this, uh, my thought, I, I just lost my place. I was going to say, um, uh, this is Steve from the Mass Pirate Party. Um, no, I, I think you're... I think mass hole is a, is a perfectly fine term to use. <laughs> I just making, I didn't want to offend nobody. I was just making sure I'm using the right terminology. Uh, so the, the big thing also with pirate parties that I think that everyone, when I say the every man, this is where I really need people to understand where I'm coming from is we're not just a party for the people by the people but we are working people. We are all people that have jobs. We are small business owners. We work in food. We work in hospitals. They, you, you see pirates from all walks of the earth, all fields of professions, and you see that we can get together and we have the ability to get together and we, you know, we are for the most common good. What is the, what is the thing that will benefit the most people? And I think as a party of people, for the people, by the people, we have the best grip on what it takes, what will, what will bring the most good. Because we are willing to listen to ideological differences. We are willing to listen to, hey, this is important to you. Tell us why it's important to you. And maybe we could talk about it. Maybe we could change your mind. Maybe you'll change our mind. You know, we, we're a very fluid party. It's a very, I mean, pirates, fluid. It's a very ever-changing uh, dichotomy, or it's never, oh, dichotomy is not the right word. Point is, is that we are ever-growing, ever-changing for the people, by the people. And I think that you're not going to find a better representation of just what the every man, every woman, every child wants than pirates. Yeah, we, we certainly, so, sorry, you go, Joe. I'm sorry, go ahead. I uh, just said you're here. What was that, I'm sorry? I fully agree with everything, especially the mass hole part. <laughs> you know what? It's uh, That is perhaps the most important thing. I think when you – when you're looking at us, again, we – we are the United States Pirate Party in the sense that we are United State Party. 
right? We are not we, – we don't look at a blanket what is an American and try to paint this grand picture for an entire country to follow this, this guideline. We, we keep it relatively open. We have a platform that the state parties, you know, adhere to that the national party sets out, but we're still a party of uh, – there's still locality uniqueness, and you still see groups of people like uh, – what, what, what a mass hole needs versus what a Chicagoan needs might have overlap, but they are going to be two different things. And what you're going to see is – the overlap is we still want what's best for the locality. We still want what's best for the people. And the more localized you get, the more specific it gets. That's why we break this down into pirate parties, state parties. If we just thought we have the the best solution for everybody, we would just have a national party and make every state party have a copy paste uh, platform. We are I the fact that we are actually past that and that we can say it is better to have state parties that are more akin to their state, that actually care about the needs of their state. That's very important. There's no, it's not so much an agenda as much as it is a, a goal. We have goals. Uh, we aim to have a more democratic system in place. We aim to have a more democratic country. We aim to more, have more democratic states, cities, counties, townships. It's, the most beautiful thing about the Pirate Party is the fact that we are not a homogenous entity. It is the fact that we are people from all across the world. This is past the United States now. The Pirate Party of Austria does not look like the Pirate Party of Czechia, which does not look like the Pirate Party of France. The same way the Pirate Party of Massachusetts and the Pirate Party of Illinois won't look like the Pirate Party of California. But we're all Pirate Parties. We are all united under that same goal. And if you dig down into your heart deep enough, anyone can be a pirate, and anyone can see themselves being a pirate. A lot of people have tried to come in and change what the idea of a pirate party is, and you can't simply change it based on one person's ideals. There is a conversation to be had. We are a group. We are a working mind and a collective to look for the best solution. We're not going to come up with a consensus that everyone agrees on, we come up with what is the best solution, what is the best for everybody. I mean, one thing I will say from the standpoint of, of issues, and I'm particularly proud that Massachusetts has a very robust set, a robust platform, but even before we didn't, when it was kind of the core pirate principles, you know, you know, our positions were, we want to put people before corporations. We have to have government transparency and we have to defend people's privacy. But, and, and of course the standard challenging of copywriting patents. Um, but, you know, we've gone on from that where we have planks on affirming individual autonomy, elections and voting, education for all, healthcare as a human right. Um, having a secure livelihood for everyone, you know, reproductive freedom is a human right, uh, ending the drug war, uh, ending xenophobia, um, you know, sex worker rights is worker rights, addiction, you know, we've got policies on addiction, the need for decentralized technology, you know, actually promoting competition. You know, we're not bought and paid for by Wall Street. We are not beholden to them. And as we've seen increasingly, you know, Wall Street has been getting corporations to merge, reducing, increasing their profits, but decreasing competition. You know, we don't, we want to see an opening up of competition. That's the only way we're going to see true innovation. And, you know, where we don't have positions, we're open to listening. So, I mean, if you're interested, you can find ours, and I'll put a link in the description at masspirates.org slash blog slash our issues. Uh, and we're very proud of the positions that we've come up. It's taken us a lot of time to figure out what we want, but we don't have everything, and we're certainly willing to listen to other perspectives. Not on bodily autonomy, though. That, that's a, I mean, that's a red line we will not cross. Not. You have to have that. Sorry. To be honest, I'm willing to listen to anyone who would like to argue about it, but we'll see which one has the more solid idea. 
Fair enough. Always <laughs> willing to disagree. And I think a lot of that's what? the beauty about the Pirates is not a lot of parties are willing to have these disagreements. A lot of people are set in their ideological ways and will say, hey, we appreciate what you're trying to do, but that's not the way things run around here. We won't say that. To you. We will, even if we disagree with you on a uh, on personal levels, we will say professionally and ideologically what will be the best case scenario, what will be the best. And let's duke it out if you really think that that benefits the most people. Uh, but we're never going to just flat out tell you no, unless unless it's something horrible that you're coming up with. Uh, we we are open minded and we're going to at least talk to you about it. We're going to at least listen. I think it was uh, Steve who I quoted in saying, if you want to commit political suicide, we're not going to get in your way. (laughs) Here's the room. (laughs) Well, no, I I think that I I think what I've what I typically say is more general in terms of um, never get between anyone and their Darwin Award. But I think, Joe, your your comment is a a, a logical extension of that. But we've seen certainly since, well, since the 90s, uh, if not even before, that so many people viewpoint as there are only two choices, Democrat or Republican. And as we saw with our previous uh, presentation about ranked choice voting, we need to open that up. Now, our ideal is proportional representation. Our ideal is true direct democracy. And that's what we're pushing. Um, But at the same time, if we can open it up so people aren't, you know, so the people don't just, oh, you're a pirate. Well, I'm only a Republican or I'm only a Democrat. I can't listen to what you have to say. If we can make our system more pluralistic, then we can have more voices and that will open up our system so that we have more choices come election day. And ultimately, more choices, less uh, less necessarily I- rigidly ideological, by encouraging direct democracy, so that people have a voice and control over their local elections or over their local policy, state policy, and federal policy. Yeah, and I mean, even um, you know, as I think, you know, the Massachusetts Pirate Party, there have been occasions where, you know, our Views have changed, <laughs> you know, based on talking to people and positions of our positions have changed. Like um, one notable one was, I, I think, was um, you know GMOs, where we were, you know, initially very opposed to them, primarily because of Monsanto um, and you know the way they per- use them. But you know, a, some of the feedback that we got from people, it's like, hey, uh, you know, this isn't the only, you know, the only place where GMOs come into come into um, come into play like for example you we have you know there have been genetically modified versions of rice that increase the protein content and you know this has actually been uh, important in feeding populations and you know that was stuff like that got us to like reflect and you know reevaluate and I think that's um, you know I have I have some pride in being able to say that, you know, we were on, you know, once in a while, it's okay for someone to show you that you're to, 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 to discover that you're wrong and to change your opinion based on that. Sorry, Mitch, we didn't mean to to steal the show from you.
I'm so sorry about that, gentlemen. My uh, my health at work uh, never shows, so I'm here by myself. But I, I was listening to your points and ju- just the fact that you could change your opinion and grow as a party and be able to actually listen to outside feedback instead of, you know, kind of – we don't exist in an echo chamber. We don't allow ourselves to just hear one point of view and stay with that point of view and anyone dissenting from that point of view is wrong. We – will listen, and we will adapt, and we will change. And I think that that's one of the most important parts of this party, is we do not sit here and pretend like we had it all figured out from the word jump, is we are willing to actually sit down, discuss, and change with the times and change with the people as long as we think that the change that we're making is for the betterment of the people. So one thing I would like to add when we talk about the everyman, although, sorry, I should have called you on gender, but every person, I apologize for that, um, is the need, you know, you look at where the economy has gone in the United States since the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, and We're seeing this even with Reagan, but we've seen, as I mentioned, economic concentration, but we've seen more power, more wealth accrue to the very rich such that they can have their little, their little play space programs or their little play projects or their little play newspapers, um, which aren't really, I mean, they, they are in a number of ways significant. But they shouldn't have that power. It should be the people that decide where we want to go and put our resources. We're facing a climate catastrophe. We're facing potentially a six-degree increase uh, in the average price, the, uh, the average temperature of the planet. There's no way we as a society can exist in that situation. You think, well, six degrees, it's not that big a deal. I've dealt with, you know, going from 70 to 100, but that means the number of days that are over 90 or where your wet bulb temperature is too high such that you cannot live as a human being are going to grow. That means more hurricanes, more typhoons, um, less time for growing plants or where things move into say it's maybe nicer in in Canada but Canada doesn't have soil in in the upper parts of Alberta for example um, that are going to sustain crops easily and so the rich the billionaires aren't going to make those changes because they've got their money and they're quite willing to keep it that way and they don't care if the rest of us die. Sorry to be a downer. Uh, any other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to riff off your point real quick. Is just the the incoming climate disaster and the income the the climate change that we're experiencing right now. Truly, you can't tell me that the rising third party movement in this country doesn't come directly from politicians and the main two parties ignoring this, and in, it, where you have one party in its entirety saying it doesn't exist and that it's that it's a hoax and that man made you know isn't changing the climate that much or their narrative changes as the time changes because it's becoming harder and harder to deny the fact that the climate is changing. I believe Congress has an approval rating of about 13%. That is hardly the will of the people for there to be 13% of Congress. Only 13% of Congress has been, you know, approved by this country. I'm sorry, only 13% of this country approves of what Congress is doing, rather. Uh, when you're looking at the will of the people, you can't tell me that these people who are taking money from companies like ExxonMobil 
are listening and are actually taking into account the dangers of what this party or what this country is falling into and what the world is falling into. Because it isn't just us that are affected by climate change, it's the entire world. There are countries that are going to be more affected by climate change than others. So when talking about, you know, the will of the people and listening to the will of the people, I think that's an important aspect of it is you see parties like the Pirate Party rise up because of the not just dissatisfaction, but the, uh, I want to call it the annoyance, the fact that we're not being listened to, that the will of the people is constantly being ignored, and it's to the detriment of the world that we're living in. Yeah, I mean, to go off that, there have been studies that show that Congress people are far more likely to listen to a billionaire or a millionaire uh, in terms of what they want than they are to, to make policy on behalf of their actual constituents. And with certainly one party, but not, not solely just the Republican Party, gerrymandering districts so that they have even less competition, um, that's going, that, that means that they're protected uh, and they can just keep racking up that money and doing the bidding of the rich over the rest of us while trying to keep dividing us into going and saying, well, it's them that are causing the problems um, and not admitting their own role in that. It's almost like they wouldn't want to be honest with us that they'd rather listen to their donors than their constituents, uh, which, you know, is such a shame. When did, when did the political system in this country become, become a politician so you can get rich? And it, like that, this is a broken system that we are currently existing in, and it cannot continue. And I feel like that's why you, you see parties like our own who are actively fighting for a better democratic system. The, the system we have in place is unacceptable in terms of actual democracy. Picking someone to ignore us for two years in Congress or six years in the Senate is, is hardly a democratic system. Yeah, I mean, true, the, true democracy, we should just go and randomly choose the people who are in Congress every two years. <clears throat> that would probably be more successful and more representative of the people, though who gets to who gets the choose the random the randomness algorithm is of course well an interesting one yeah i mean as I, I also bring up the fact that we have elections but we also have the money primary before so that not only are we allowed to only choose generally between two candidates although in massachusetts sometimes you don't even have two two choices especially for the legislature where 60% don't have any don't have an opponent in the general election but who even gets on the ballot who even gets listened to by the media is very much dependent upon who can raise the money from generally wealthy donors in order to build up um you know build up a build up their war chest to actually run or to maintain their power. And that's why the pirate position of devolving power down to local people is the is the more solid one. Our, our example should be ancient Athens and not ancient Rome, bread and circuses. If I may. Please. I would say that we're better and more more proactive about decentralization in government than even the libertarians are. My gauntlet has been thrown at you, libertarians. Joe, on that point, I would argue that we are actively promoting democracy, where the New Age Libertarian Party has said that democracy is mob rule. So if you're looking for it on the democratic aspect, we are perhaps the more democratic of the two, and it's not even close. Yeah, we're more democratic than the Democrats. <laughs> I, I, 
A hundred percent, Joe. I'd say you were right. Yeah, I mean, when when your viewpoint is that government itself is the problem, and harken back to some authoritarian rule to excuse to to say why it's a problem and that it's going to be oppressive, um, then. <clears throat> If, if that's your mindset, then you don't actually believe in the people making choices, right? And so we've seen that with oftentimes libertarians, they, they want you to vote for them uh, so they can make sure that you don't have any power. I don't quite understand that rationale, but that's theirs. And on that same note, the one thing that I always thought was interesting about the Libertarian Party, because as I speak as a former member, I, 2016 election, I really started getting into politics, as you can imagine. Uh, and I kind of really enjoyed the platform that Gary Johnson was running on at the time. And I learned that Gary Johnson was very much an outlier of what the rest of the party sort of was like. To see a party denounce uh, government but then also be anti-union uh, it was just such a bizarre thing for me. Uh, it's as though you say you want power out of the hands of the people, but you just don't want it in the hands of a public entity. You want it in the private sector, uh, which is – I mean, there's a reason I'm no longer part of the Libertarian Party. Yeah, I mean, that general philosophy is what I would – I would put that under the umbrella of anarcho-capitalism. Um, and as any anarchist will tell, you will have a difficult time finding an actual anarchist who, who will claim that anarcho-capitalists are anarchists. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if you're quite willing to allow a small number of people to amass great power, uh, and yet you don't want the actual people to have much in the way of power, then really you're just trying to create another oligopoly uh, not sorry, another oligarchy, uh, or worse, something even smaller, um, of power and limit what people can do. I mean, freedom is not the free, not the freedom to exploit. It is the freedom to express your, your desires, the freedom to have the ability to express those desires so long as they do not harm, uh, or negatively affect others. And that is the tension in rights and responsibilities. And the pirates, I think, are better able to navigate that. I mean, I, I hark back to, um, you know, and that whole nautical uh, motif of pirates, their enemy were the forces of government, um, and the forces of authority and the sea itself. And by banding together collectively in a democratic way to elect their own leaders and chart their own direction is the way to be as we live on this planet that is increasingly being devastated by our own actions. This is the only life we have. There is no Earth 2.0. And so we have to collectively come together and be able to chart a way to maintain life on this planet and maintain true freedom, the freedom to express yourself without exploiting other people. If I may. Please. You know, I mean, they say we have inalienable rights, right? Like the right to bear arms, the right to free speech, but those rights were bought by the blood of patriots and are maintained by, by the fights that we, the people, fight on a regular basis. How quickly are the powers that be trying to erode away our rights right before our very eyes? If we don't stand up for it, they're just going to come for them. And if we let them, they'll just take them. So very much you should choose a pirate because a pirate is going to fight for your right to party. See what I did there? Very much so. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly completely agree with that. We need way more partying and uh, way less uh, conflict. You know, I'm, I'm sure it would be far better if the Ukrainians could go and uh, party with Russians. Well, Russians who aren't trying to invade their country and take away their rights and liberties. <clears throat> Which, you know, incidentally, the libertarian don't seem to be defending the Ukrainians, but all right, well, I think we've been bashing, perhaps we've been bashing the libertarians a little too much. So, uh, Mitch, how can folks help the national party? So the way that I think folks can best help the national party is if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to any of our emails, any of the PNC members or any of the captains of the state parties would be happy to help anyone. Uh, if you are curious about a pirate party that you know is formed in your state, reach out to that state party. If you don't see a pirate party formed in your state or if you see on the about section of the USPP website where we have pirate parties that are in the process of forming and you're interested in being a part of that process, Again, don't hesitate to reach out. We have a Discord server that most of our pirates are active on, that most of our pirates check in. We'll be happy to answer any questions. It is where we have our outreach and platform meetings as well. Uh, you are welcome to attend IRC meetings. We have every uh, two weeks we switch off between video and uh, IRC. IRC is a text-based service or is a text, uh, text to chat uh, uh, tool that is very helpful to get to know everybody, to uh, get to answer questions without the pressure of being live streamed to YouTube. Uh, we are available to answer your questions. We're happy to answer your questions. And if you really want to get involved in something that's fighting for the most democratic United States, most democratic world that we can think of, then I, I encourage you all, I implore you all to join the Pirate Party. And then how can people find the United States Pirate Party? Uh, if you want to find the United States Pirate Party, we have a Wikipedia page. But the best way to find us would be uspirates.org. Uh, that is the Nationals website. And I think that you'd be able to get a good idea of what you're dealing with, not just nationally, but at the state level. And if you want to get more involved and you want to find out what the state level is like, check out one of our state chapters' uh, websites. Massachusetts especially has a fantastic website where you can see a lot of the platform positions and a lot of the issues that are key. Uh, Illinois, I'm very proud of how our website looks. I'm looking, I, I hope to see Illinois grow in the coming years. If we can compete with Massachusetts and how well you all have been doing up there, I would be very proud of my party. And what are the other states that have active pirate parties? So currently the uh, PNC recognized states would be Massachusetts, Illinois, California, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. And in Kentucky, we actually have a candidate running for Congress in Kentucky's uh, fourth congressional district. He's in Osborne. So Joe, if you're looking you... to help on Ethan Osborne's campaign, uh, if you live in uh, the Cincinnati metropolitan area in the Kentucky side, uh, you can not only vote for Ethan, but you can help Ethan on his campaign. Perhaps we can start getting some pirates in D.C. And what is Ethan running for again? He is running for Congress in the United States. Uh, he's running for United States Congressman in Kentucky 4. That is uh, Thomas Massey's district. Nice. Joe, you wanted to say something. I did. I would have to say good sir with the honorable beard that is not a competition it's a cooperative and that is you know what i'm so glad you used the word cooperative because i i'm a firm believer in making the democratic system down to the nitty-gritty to where everyone has a piece and everyone has a say i believe in workplace democracy i think i am a big advocate of worker cooperatives and the fact that we operate as a cooperative does make me proud to be a pirate.
Honestly, I'm really glad you're a part of our team. Not going to lie. Thank you, Joe. I, I really – I thank you for the compliments on the beard as always. It does brings a smile to my bearded face. We need more beards. Both pirate girl beard. Are. Um, so with that, do you have anything else you'd like to touch on, Mitch? Uh, I think the one thing I do want to touch on one last time is the uh, – you mentioned pirates, like actual like pirate ship democracy. I think it is perhaps – it was something that wasn't intentional when uh, the first pirate party in Sweden formed, but I think it's one of the things that we should actually look to embrace a little bit more. Uh, on the Illinois Pirate Party website, I did – I addressed the uh, – the question of are we pirates like the parrot on the shoulder pirates? Are we pirates like the internet pirates? Are we pirates like the Edelweiss pirates of Nazi Germany? And the answer is yes. The 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 idea of being a pirate and fighting for the most democratic system, for fighting for liberty and fighting for freedom and fighting against oppression, it is it's one of the most important things I could think of that we that embodies the word and the name and the concept of a pirate we have a beautiful history of pirates do and i think we should seek further to embrace that concept i feel as though they were the most revolutionary democratic folk of their time i wrote a fantastic book by uh, marcus redeker by the uh, name the book title was villains of all nations and it kind of touched upon of pirate ship democracy and how they were almost proto-socialist in a way, that, that it was the first time you saw uh, liberated slaves coming together and joining a pirate ship and be, being a unit, deciding on their captain, able to remove their captain at any point. The, it, it's a beautiful history, and, and obviously histories are never perfect. And history tends to have blemishes that can paint an image but I believe the concept of a pirate should not be one that's tainted. Many people will say they're thieves and robbers, and like the title of the book, they're villains of all nations. But if you fight hard enough for something you believe in, you're bound to get people that go against you. And the fact that the people, that it was the nation state that said these pirates are up to no good should tell you a lot about what we were actually up to. Yeah, to add, add to that, I mean, my personal viewpoint is billionaires did not get their money. They may have gotten their money legally, but um, they certainly did not get it without stepping on a lot of people. Um, and so when we go and we look back and we castigate pirates as thieves and brigands, uh, we already have thieves and they're robbing us blind. They're robbing blind. They're, they're robbing us uh, of our income, they're robbing us of our children's future, we're robbing our planet of future species. Um, why do we let them maintain their power? As pirates, we have to make sure they don't have any more power, because literally if we let them have power, we will not have a future. So with that, um, our next speaker is at or, oh, great. Um, we have our next speaker. Um, anything else you want to add, Mitch, or can we just move on to the next speaker? No, I just want to say thank you all for having me, uh, and I wish you all the best of luck for the rest of the day and for your futures. I am very proud to be a part of an organization uh, to be with pirates like the Massachusetts pirates who have worked so hard for their goals and have achieved so much. I look forward to what you guys have planned in the future. I am very proud of what you guys have already accomplished, and I look forward to continuing to work with you all. Thank you, Mitch. Your, your energy and enthusiasm has been really inspiring. Thank you so much. You guys have a great rest of your night, and I will, I will see you all later. And you too do. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for having me. And so thank we're... You, we're joined by members of the Agaric Tech Collective to talk about privacy and free software. 
Um, I see Keegan and Mickey, and um, we, we also have a, another new person who I'm not sure if they're here <laughs> or part of a or, or part of us. So um, with that, I'll leave the forum open to them to talk about privacy and free software. Thank you all for very, very much for joining us. Hey, thank you. Hey, Mickey. This is a wonderful ship. Um, it's a little windy. I'm uh, adjusting the jib right now so that we can have smooth sailing through the straits. <laughs> Those bad rocks on the right. Look out. <coughs> yeah, and and Chris is Chris is going to be with us in a minute or two, but we can we can go ahead and uh, at least um, start just by introducing ourselves, I guess. And so, um, so I, I guess we could, you know, I guess Jamie, you, you kind of already introduced our topic a little bit. We're, you know, we're here, and as, as everyone saw in the in the conference schedule, we're here talking about privacy and free software today. <laughs> um, and uh, just to introduce ourselves, um, Mickey, Chris, and myself, Chris, who will be here shortly are all um, work runners of a, a co of a cooperative. We're here based in, in Boston. And um, um, there are, we're three of five members of a, of a, of Agaric and a um, few of us in a few different, couple other places around the world. But <laughs> um, anyway, um, I think as far as introductions for, for ourselves personally, Mickey, I was thinking we could just say, our, um, well, everyone knows our names, but so how about um, rather than focus on other sorts of introductions, we just tell people how we, you know, um, how we discovered free software for ourselves and, you know, what it did um, for us in our, in our lives personally. Um, does that sound good? Sounds great. Um, would you like to start with that one? Sure. Yes. I was uh, floating on the sea and... Uh... I saw something shiny up ahead, and uh, it was a sea of um, corporate software I was floating in, and I was finding all these gates and, um, well, not Bill, but I was finding all these horribly locked gates and things I could not do, and I was wondering why I didn't know about free software, and um, then somehow I stumbled onto it. I, I believe a friend um, introduced me, and at, at that time, it was in the 90s, so it was there was a big thing of freeware and free trial and software and all of this stuff that um, they just uh, kept confusing people as they do today. So I eventually stumbled into a free software foundation site and started reading and started getting involved and realizing, oh, that's, that's going to save the world. My God. Um, but if everyone gets it, but not everyone gets it, we're still working on that. Um, and I just fell in with Agaric in um, 2008, I guess it was, and found out there were Drupal workers. Drupal is free software. And so I started working with them and realized, wow, we can build just about everything with free software that's already here. There's libraries, packages, um, there's an operating system. Oh my God, get me out of Windows. So I jumped out the window. It's right behind me. It, it didn't break. Still the glass. Uh, the glass, not the glass ceiling, though. So, uh, yeah, we were really, really happy to find it. And um, I'll let Chris go next. How did you stumble into the wonderful non-abyss of free software? Um, I, hi, everybody. I'm Chris. I uh, work around with Agaric. And... Yeah, I am, well, I'm a geek, uh, you know, I'm uh, all about computer software and have been doing it for quite a long time and used to do a lot of proprietary software development and, um, you know, in uh, 90, whatever it was, I had heard about Linux and it just kind of uh, piqued my interest to have this powerful and free system um and i just wanted to learn more about it so i kind of came through it came to it from the from the technical side um 
I wasn't particularly political at the time um, and you know really didn't have uh, any understanding of the politics around the birth of the free software mov movement specifically um, or its contrast with open source but uh, in any case, um, yeah, I mean, that was kind of how I came to it, and I ended up learning a lot about the ideolo ideology through um, meetups uh, that were, you know, there's a, a desktop desktop Linux users group in the area, and going to there, I bumped into a Garrick, and um, yeah, learned a lot more about uh, free software and, and so on. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I met... Um... Chris at the um, Libre Boston conference. Um, there is a group called Libre Boston. It's a subgroup of the uh, Linux user group in Boston. Um, and it was a big eye opening to just see a whole nother world, layers and layers and layers of it and all different forks and branches. And I'm not a developer. I'm not a back end developer, but I've had my, I guess, feet in it or up to my knees. I know enough to talk dangerously <laughs> to, to uh, developers and deeply and understand what their needs are. So for a while, I was a gopher finding free software um, solutions, mostly in Drupal. And I've got to say the Drupal community really did save my life at a point, at least my work life, um, realizing I didn't have to be under someone's thumb. I had, right before um, Agaric, I had been working at a um, proprietary software company building an app similar to Google Hangouts back in the 90s. And um, it was, uh, yeah, funded with $100 million that went right in the toilet um, <laughs> as the company just blew up and was robbed and pillaged from the inside. So that was a big disaster. I didn't know what I was going to do. But um, I landed on my feet thanks to free software. And now I just can't stop telling people about it. And um, finding um, groups and organizations that need to protect their privacy and the privacy of their members and the privacy of their clients. Um, this is, it just spreads out and out. It's, um, I wish it was, you know, as contagious as some of these things we have going around in the world. Um, but yeah, lighting a fire under someone and introducing them to a world is um, amazing. Um, just a little bit about what I'm doing right now is I'm hooking up ideas that can give people a way to start in a career or start a new way of work by creating their own jobs using free software, like packaging up a bunch of free software into a bundle and distributing it, um, selling it, um, giving it away free. So you could put all the tools you need to do a podcast in a, into a bundle and call it, you know, Mickey's bundle of joy, whatever, and have, have all the in, introductory um, info so that people could learn to what is this software about and how to get deeper into the rabbit hole. Um, seems to be sparking some interest in people um, trying to start their own things, like just realizing there's a great need for security and privacy. There's an app called OAP that tests your site for breaches and um, you know, where, where you're insecure. So someone could start a business by doing that, running that software for people, and then hiring some experts to fix the, um, the open parts that they find in there, the leaky bits in the boat, and uh, help other people sail correctly. So yeah, I love being a part of a Garrick. I love being a part of a world where people can talk about freedom in many different ways because freedom and privacy are linked inherently. There's, they're like chained together, manacles. So uh, Keegan, anything to say about what you do, what you find best and most helpful in the free software world and spreading the knowledge? Sure, I mean, just, just a little bit about my background with free software and um, more in, in general. So I, um, I don't know if I mentioned. I, um, well, I, well, I am. So I am. I am now a web developer with um, with Agaric. And um, before before I got into web development, um, I really wanted to stay as far away from computers as possible. 
was really <laughs> was really a big part of my goals in life. I went I went to school. I went to undergrad for um, environmental science. Um, I was at the University of Maryland studying environmental science. I studied soils. I wanted to be in the dirt. <laughs> I, I wanted I wanted nothing to do with computers. I spent uh, after I graduated, I spent a couple of years um, participating on a research project in Trinidad, trying to stay away <laughs> from having to do anything that had anything to do with computers. <laughs> it turns out it's really hard <laughs> to do anything in this world um, where a computer's not involved, and. Um, and I, well, at least when it comes to a career at, in this in this day and age, I'm sure there are like a few exceptions here and there. Well, there's a gradient, <laughs> right? Um, different different people need computers different different amounts. But anyway, um, before before I had made that transition, um, I found myself um, you know n just noticing I hadn't. Um, I, I was, I, had, I don't think I had necessarily understood what free software meant, yet I had known about um, the GNU Linux operating system um, and that, you know, it was a, a better alternative or a more, you know, ethical and safer alternative to Windows and Mac OS. So I had some uh, familiarity with you know, the idea that there were probably softwares that I could trust more than others, but I didn't have a deep understanding of what free Libre software meant or, you know, all the politics around free software versus open source. Those weren't things that I was yet familiar with. Um, and I remember in like 2018 or so, you know, just um, being on my Android phone and, you know, I had like some games installed from the Google Play Store or, you know, I had tried like some dating apps or things. And, and, you know, these are all, these are all things that like that everyone is trying. I didn't understand fully, you know, the politics behind all of these apps and the, these softwares yet, but I was getting a sense of it because while I was using them, I felt like I was under attack. <laughs> You know, while I was using these softwares, I actually just felt like they were attacking me. And, um, of course, of course, you know, at the time I wasn't studying that. I didn't try to get into it and really research it. But in the next couple of years, I did, I did start researching it. And I'm really grateful um, for having met um, these uh, Mickey and Chris and everyone at Agaric. And I've start, started, started getting more familiar with... Um, you know what? What's really going on underneath of all this software? Because um, it started to become clear to me that these softwares really are attacking me <laughs> by um, by collecting a lot of my data and not necessarily being very transparent about that. So, um, so yeah, I think that when I when I started to make that transition and and have that to have had that personal experience and then to have started you know, developing closer relationships with a, a team of web developers and to start thinking more about how can I configure my own personal devices and think more critically about what kinds of software I install on my own systems or not even necessarily on my own systems, but what kind of software I use in general. Um, I, I, I noticed a, um, that my mental health began to improve um, because I found my, I, because I had started to lay, you know, some guidelines and rules for myself saying like, don't use these tools if they're not free. And if you have simple rules, I mean, obviously there, there's a lot more to it than that. And that gets to be a really nuanced discussion because there are some things that are hard to avoid for one reason or another. Um, but, um, but Generally speaking, I, I did find that, um, you know, by switching to using more and more free software and the more I learned about it, the better that I felt um, in terms of my relationship with my electronic devices, my digital, dev my digital devices. 
So um, I, I, want, I think that's how I would sort of lay out my narrative, my relationship with free software, is that definitely um, I, I will say that it has been a liberating journey um, emotionally. Um, and I think that is something that I feel like I, when I hear people talk about free software a lot, you know, there's a lot of like dogma in, in the conversations around free software. And, you know, sometimes um, I feel like it's helpful to just say like, look, like this free software, like changed my life. And it did these things for me, you know, and here, like, here's how, here's how it helped me. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my story. Um, and I, yeah, I think, um, we can, um, maybe just take a moment to, um, have a, for anyone who doesn't know, just kind of take a moment to just have a quick conversation about what is free software and, you know, what is open source software. Um, because I, there may be some people, um, who don't know that those distinctions are, um, so Mickey or Chris, would you like to take a stab at it or? Yeah, I'll just say it's a wonderful pile of tools that does affect your mental health. You're totally right on that. Um, few of my students, um, I do take on students and um, enlighten them to this whole world that we've crawled under this rock to find. And um, people have told me their mental health has improved and the, the way they think about the world and the connectivity, how we're all connected in this world. Um, it, it's just amazing. And Chris, I know you have some things to say on the differences between open source and free software. Uh, it's a very hard, nuanced political thing to explain to people that um, you do have some, some freedom here, but you do have to look for it and you do have to do research. You do have to connect with people. So Chris, ahoy, what do you say? Um, well, I... I would come at it from uh, the point of defining open source software first, I guess. Um, I mean, probably most of the audience is familiar with what that means. Um, but at, at the end of the day, um, you know, if you have access to the source code and you can change it and redistribute it, then in, in general terms, you have open source software. Um, you know, you're, you're able to see, modify, share, et cetera, the, the, the software. Um, going a, a step uh, uh, I'll put beyond in quotes beyond that um, there's free software um, and you know free software is more dedicated not to the way that the software is developed but what the um, what the moral standing of the software is so to speak um, so when you have um, when you have uh, something that is classified specifically as free software, that that software's author wants to say that, um, or generally wants to say that this this software isn't um, isn't going to mistreat you. It's going to preserve your freedom. Um, that's what it's about, you know, is is maintaining the end user's freedom, the people that use the software um, to do with it as they please and to share it, and so on. Um, so, you know, it really accentuates the, the freedom value, um, and, you know, there, there are, um, you know, big difference in, in practical terms, um, when you're dealing with somebody that focuses on open source versus free software in terms of, uh, what kind of downstream licensing for software can be. Um, so, you know or what the downstream repercussions are. So, for example, um, an open source software advocate might say, okay, sure, you can you can take this and you can do what you want with it, including um, releasing a version of this program that is not with its source code. Um, so you can actually change it and not release the source code of your changes. Um, now, to a free software advocate, that would be 
um, mistreatment of the user to preclude them from accessing the source. Um, so, you know, it, the um, there are measures that the Free Software Foundation and, you know, started by Richard Stallman has taken to ensure that those rights are preserved over the lifetime of the project. Um, and those are referred to as copy left licenses where, um, you know, essentially you are you are not allowed to redistribute the software without the source code period. Even if you go and make your own changes to it, if you share that with people, you need to share the source code with them as well. Um, so yeah, so you know, it's that that's that's those are the big differences that I see anyways. Um, anybody anybody else? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's a huge difference as to whether you're building something that's community centric or you're building something um, just to aggregate money in your bank account. Um, and free software includes your community. You're thinking about how this benefits the community while you're building it. And you're thinking of being inclusive of people. You don't build something and bring it to someone. You talk with people and see what are their needs, what needs do they have to fulfill, and also while educating them about their privacy, because um, that's something that is just closing down on us right now rather quickly. Um, I had to, I was, when I go to sleep at night, I usually listen to some kind of a tech thing while I'm dozing off, and I put a link to Rob Braxman in the um, chat, public chat. Um, he's one of a, a privacy guru online. He has a lot of great information. Sometimes he can be a bit rambly, but he goes so deep and is so important to our world. I hope everyone dials into him. Um, but I was listening to him last night and I had to, I couldn't sleep. I was having to do belly laughs every few minutes. He was uh, talking about Apple who presenting themselves as the big privacy company. They'll take care of your privacy. You don't have to worry about it. And now there's a thing called Apple Lockdown, where they have <laughs> put, um, the, instead of fixing vulnerabilities, they've given the user a way to completely turn it off, you know, and that, that's their solution. Oh, okay, we don't have to fix this uh, vulnerability. We'll just let the button, you know, user use a button, turn that off. You don't need any of that. So it's, it's kind of a, like people are in a um, fog and can't really look deeply because they don't have the technical know-how or technical backgrounds. So they just go with a company that they trust. And a company like Apple pumps up their trust so much that people can't look behind the veneer and go, wow, they're not protecting me. They're just saying I can turn it off. So I'm, I'm paying for all these features, but now I can turn them off and I'm not have any. So um, I have a de-Googled phone, which I love. I, I am just enamored of it. It does everything I need. And I did get it from Rob Braxman, but he also t helps you um, de-Google your own phone. This is not uh, something deep and mysterious. Um, you can do this yourself. So I love it that you can actually take actions yourself, but I don't love it that you don't know where to get help in this all the time. And that's a big um, stumbling block for free software. People don't know how to get help. There's no genius bar. There's no, you know, like dialing direct uh, call the service um, desk. Um, it's more done in forums and groups and emails and connecting with people, actually talking to people instead of treating them like a number, stand in line and, you know, the genius will be with you in a moment. You are the genius. Don't forget that. <laughs> you can find it. If you don't know where to find it out, just you know someone who knows someone who knows someone. So it's like getting on a different wavelength. And um, that's that's hard for people to do who have been used to like, oh, just call the service IT guy and they'll fix it. <laughs> you know, And it's like the service IT guy, oh, is he Microsoft certified? You know, it's like, <laughs> this is terrible. It's a terrible trick. Like these magicians will come in and fix it for you. No, they won't. <laughs> they won't. They'll sell I mean, more stuff. 
<laughs> on that on that day, the last time I called the Microsoft service person, I got thrown around a loop for like a month until they finally accepted that my problem was what I said it was. <laughs> so just just submit. But um let's see. Um I did I did want to mention just one other part of kind of adding on to um what Chris had mentioned earlier. Um about the um, the distinction between um, open source and free software, and and maybe not to try to add to the definition, but to sort of give a, a bit of an anecdote to the difference in how they might be used. Um, and so I I tend to think that you know open source software is really is really suited for the like startup type culture. You know, not, it's not necessarily just startup. It, it goes a lot further than that. But you know, when I when I but I like to use this as an example, right? Because a lot of startup companies are you know trying to build something really quick and then either sell a product or get acquired or something like that. And a lot of the time, um, the way I see it, like a somewhat somebody who's basically looking for big investors to dump money into things. There, it's going to be advantageous for someone who's looking for that kind of investor to try to build something that's not free software, because well, that's that's usually going to be true <laughs> anyway. And the re and the reason that I that that is is that you know a lot of a lot of big investors like a lot of people make money these days by spying on people, basically because they want to collect your data and sell data. That's how a lot of people are making money. So if 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 someone you know builds open source and open source software, not not free software, then you know they they can build that software and it can you know be all the, the functional parts you know a good system that works and everything, and then they can sell it to a big company or get acquired, and then that big company can you know then start to add on all this spyware things to it, and then you know that and then they don't have to tell anyone about that so. That's just um, that, that's at least how I kind of see the the startup like economy working in, in relation to open source versus free software. Um, that's a, that's at least a pretty like rough analysis. There, I'm sure that's a much more nuanced, nuanced conversation that I have not researched deeply. Um, um, but did we want to move into? I guess that's a good segue to the conversation of what um, of what using free software looks like in practice, um, including including finding finding tools. Whether we're talking about finding tools, building tools, using um, using them on a you know personal or larger scale. Um, let's see, um, Nikki, do you have a uh, do you have some any? Um, I guess do you have. Do you, would you want to start um, trying to answer that question yourself? Like, what, what what advice would you give people there, or just or just general thoughts you have about that? Well, um, Chris and I wrote a blog last year. Um, needs to be updated, and part two and three and four and nine through a thousand need to be added. It's a living um, document. I put a link in the chat, and it's the free software tools that Agaric uses daily. A lot of people have found this really helpful. I think we need um, more people posting things like this online about how to um, find free software and then even deeper, how to vet free software. Do you know someone using it? Um, has it worked for anyone you know? What what areas of, of uh, technology is most advanced in using free software? Because we don't have free hardware yet, so that is still an open-ended thing. Um, it's hard to not have a foundation of freedom to build on and just have the software layer, but the Free Software Foundation is wor at work on that. Um, designs for um, the circuit boards for um, hardware. So that should be coming along soon. Um, it's, it's just uh, an endless detective uh, thing. I love detective. Um, things, but I don't like all the murder and shit around it. So, <laughs> so I gravitated to murdering um, proprietary software instead. 
<laughs> leaving the the uh, bits and bites on the side of the uh, the ribbon there. So, yeah, I would say it has definitely changed my life. It's changed the life of others. It's slow going. There's a lot of answers, a lot of hand holding at the beginning, but soon your students will be coming to you with things that you didn't know and expanding your knowledge and um, building directories of free software. Like um, the other link I put in there, switching.software. You can go there and type in the name of a software that you're using and come up with some suggestions to switch to an alternative. So um, yeah, Hamad has a question. So uh, firstly, uh, hello everyone. I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Hamad. Uh, I'm actually working with Agaric on a volunteer project. I'm volunteer with UNICEF uh, on virtual safe spaces. So thank you very much, Miki, for the invitations. And this uh, session was super, uh, I would say, super helpful for me because I learned the differences between uh, open source and free softwares uh, in, in my uh, since I graduated from university, I adopted Drupal as a uh, CMS and I'm a pure certified Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 site builder. But the fact is, most of uh, the people in our area still are not even aware of what's the difference between open source and closed source softwares. So as Mickey has told that it's very slow, slow going. So I assume that we should uh, set uh, sessions to, to uh, we can say to vocal this awareness because uh, most of the web user, even those users which are which have tech background, are not aware that what's uh, what's the benefits of open source softwares and free softwares and how we should uh, how we should prefer them over the closed uh, source softwares because they actually prefer closed source that they can pay a single company uh, for a particular subscription and that's how they should go. So that's that's my primary question. Well, wow, thank you. Yeah, it's so important and it's there's so many little bits in it and helping someone understand free as opposed to open is a different thing. I guess most people, um, you can tell them open source, it only means that the code has to work well. Um, and of course, stepping back a little bit, free software and open source, it's all based on the licensing so people don't like to look at licenses as we know it's a, a big allergy like you start sneezing coughing i've got to get coffee i gotta get a drink i gotta go out i gotta talk to my friends you know <laughs> and it's like run away run away because it's some big long document of blather and legal terms and, and stuff and um i guess one thing i learned recently to, to help people get by that is it, you, okay, you go to use a software. The first thing you do, scroll to the bottom, go to the terms of privacy and go to the terms of service. Don't bother to read all that crap. No, no, no. First thing you do is do an in-page search for the words third party. You'll come up with anywhere from 10 to 40 different references within each document. Go down each one and read a few words on either side of the words third party and see if you agree with that. I guarantee you, you won't get past a few of them without scratching your head and going, I'm agreeing to that? Oh no. But um, it's really enlightened a lot of people. Just search for third party either side of that text, read a few words and you will know immediately if you're protected or not. And then you can act from a point of knowledge. So yeah, thank you, Hamad. It, it's very confusing to people and no one wants to read a license. You know, I dare you, <laughs> read this license. I think we should create uh, some videos about it because people don't, don't like actually reading most of the stuff. They just like uh, what they see visually. So in visuals, we, if you can cross compare those, I think it will be super beneficial or super helpful for them to understand. Yes, uh, more conferences like this. Yeah, Chris. Uh, well, I've got a number of things that piled up at this point, but uh, Steve also has a story. Um, I don't know if I want to invite him to share for a minute. Well, uh, it's it's brief. Um, I was you know sitting on the commuter rail one time, um, you know, just 
going going someplace. So I, I had the opportunity to I got into a conversation of the difference of what free software was with a person sitting next to me. And being on a on a train for a little while, you have the time to talk. But the thing that I did was I, you know, pulled up a, a license for a piece of proprietary software and pulled up in one window and pulled up the, you know, the GNU public license in another and just started comparing sections. You know, here you may, here's one license that tells you, you may have one copy of the software, but you may, you can make a backup, but you can't more than run 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 it on one computer at a time and here you could install it and use it for whatever purpose you wanted on as many pieces of on as many computers as you want and it was just i, I think the end of it, the person i was speaking with had a bit of an aha moment but um you know i'm i do i did i am sort of intrigued by hamad's idea of you know having visual licenses you know a way to you know make represent that uh, without like a mountain of text so i'm um yeah i thought that was a cool idea anyway back to you thanks steve um yeah i mean the whole well i just step back again uh just for a quick second like as far as software goes software is not sold it's licensed so we keep talking about all these license agreements and whatnot and the licenses tell you exactly what you can and can't do with the software um and just to, to throw the idea out there, I don't know that this is the right way to do things or to say that these things just shouldn't be done. Um, but there there are another there are other are other classes of licenses as well, um, where, for example, free software, um, they're about letting you use the software for any purpose you wish. Um, so that includes military, that includes whatever. Um, and there are people that have written a variety of different licenses that, uh, for example, are only allowed to be used by cooperatives or are only allowed to be used by anybody except the military and so on. So um, just to throw that out there, licenses um, say what you can and can't do, and there are other uh, licenses that are available for other purposes. Um, uh, one of the one of the points that Keegan made very early on uh, was how he was feeling abused, and that was something that um, you know when, after I had switched over to using GNU Linux for quite a while, um, when I had the the misfortune of having to use Windows again, I was like, holy crap! Like I I, I didn't even realize when I used to use Windows just how much uh, how intrusive it was to me doing what I wanted like it, it, it's hard to notice those types of things sometimes um, you know when you're when you've just you know kind of grown up in this in this area where it's just how things work kind of thing um, so when you haven't experienced the freedom sometimes you don't know what you're missing um, and the whole proprietary versus free software thing it's like you know that is a, a huge problem uh, I'm not, like I don't know how many Drupal developers walk around carting MacBooks around with them that run Mac OS. It's like I genuinely do not understand that. Um, you know, they they just I don't know. I don't get it. Like there's something something that we're missing in the whole uh, exercising of freedom there that that is being missed. And you know, one of the best ways that um, one of the best presentations that I think Richard Stallman has done. Uh, is where he has these little, these little um, cartoons where he's showing, uh, you know, um, basically, you know, logos for Apple and Microsoft, and they have a, they're holding a leash, and the leash uh, is a collar around the users, um, and you know that that's kind of a, a key piece of this is is that you know, with proprietary software, those software vendors are in control of the users, and they present what choices are available to the users, what they can and can't do at certain times. And free software is more about, you know, the user controls the software. They're not controlled by the software. Um, so those those are, you know, really kind of core distinctions that I hadn't really um, said before, but were being flirted around. Um, so there, you know, we, we're about halfway through already, and I don't mean to try to drive, but um, we had skipped over like some of the security pieces of free software. I don't know if we wanted to 
transition into that. Um, and we do have a number of um, a number of ideas of things as well uh, that could be focused on, you know, in terms of um, you know campaigning ideas or whatever um, things that. You know, maybe we should do as part of public policy for uh, in support of free software or where software free software can really be useful uh, for public good and then uh, to relevant to people looking for public office. So, yeah. so I'd like to add here, Chris, you have uh, raised all the wonderful points. So the fact is now when we are arranging uh, here uh, local Drupal camps uh, since 2019. But most of uh, the members who, or we would say the participants, they are actually very curious about open source software. And particularly since I'm associated with Drupal uh, from the start of my career. So it's, it's very hard for us to convince that why they should choose Drupal or the easy, easy ones, like for example, or the WordPress or, or a, a, any other one. The fact is first that you uh, do not understand about open source and when they start uh, learning about open source so as uh, mickey has told that they, they do not have, have even time to go through all the documentation or, and actually to differentiate at why we should pay for work so it's it's really a serious issue for us uh, since in the last three years we have been vocalizing it in the camp. the response we are getting is very slow i would say it's deadly slow so uh, we we are almost we are our think tanks here in the local community always uh, talking about it are preparing various uh, frameworks uh, to like speed up a bit but since since we are trying our efforts and we are getting the results I would say uh, very 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 uh, slow results so that's the main problem yeah one thing that I found really um, striking at a Drupal conference years ago um, I was I learned that um, people who are buying Apple products are actually interfering with the economy by raising the prices and helping to raise the prices of that's why Macs are so expensive and everything, every little dongle they sell you is, you know, making their billions, but they're also buying into a thing, making it bigger. And that thing is unobtainable by most of the world who is not wealthy. So you are really doing damage by putting money into this giant corporation that most people can't afford and relegating them to a, a world of um, not, they don't educate them about free software as an alternative or anything. So they're just blocked. So some families are spending a month's salary to get it, one iPhone for the whole family because that's the product that they have heard is the best. and will take care of them. It, it's very sad. So you're doing a disservice to um, less advantaged people. Yeah, I mean, you know, for, for software developers, it can be very tempting to want to create proprietary software. You know, it's it's the it for the long for a long time, it was the the predominant model. And you know, uh, number one company in the world by market capitalization is Apple. You know, there's proprietary software at work. Number three is Microsoft. Number four is Apple. I mean, um, Alphabet, Google. Um, you know, so th this free software is definitely something that requires um, policy level support to really be able to fight back at this point. Um, you know, we, we need to be able to, to support um, the development and improved accessibility for, for free software to really um, to help it flourish and to, to get us out from under the control of the proprietary solutions that most of the world is is beholden to at this point. Uh, so I did, did want to drive the conversation forward. As Chris was suggesting, one of the things that we wanted to just mention was that um, is that feedback from, uh, no, no feedback. Okay, great. Um, thanks, Jamie. <laughs> one of the, one of the things that we were going to mention was, um, um, so free software doesn't do everything, right? It doesn't, doesn't fix all the problems there are. There are still, there are still measures that have to be taken. You know, I've had conversations with people, um, where I've been talking about free software and then someone will bring something up, which is a really good point and a really important point to bring up. Right, like, um, like, well, what do you, you know, 
Well, okay, and then, actually, let me start here because when uh, even a lot of free software advocates will say, you know, free software is made so that a person, you know, kind of has, you know, autonomy over their own device, right? So that you can have an idea of what the programs that are on your device are doing, right? And so some some people w would go as far to say that, you know, it doesn't have as much to do with softwares that are running on a network. And certainly there are extra measures that need to be taken for any software that is being hosted on a network. Um, and so, um, Chris, did you want to, did you want to speak to any of those points about that really quick? And then, and then we can try to transition into more of our, um, the, some of our, um, well, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, uh, a couple of things there. Um, well, at least, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, free software isn't so much as about what the computing that's done on your behalf is doing. Um, you know, so when you connect to a bank site and it does a transfer, you know, the means with which they do a transfer is like, you know, that that's not something that free software really covers. Um, there are uh, a numerous free software products, though, that um, that people do use to to run on servers. Uh, and there is licensing specifically for that. Um, and that's known as the AGPL um, or the Affair of GNU Public License. Um, and the, you know, the, the idea there is that you can provide a free software that runs on a server. And when you get to the point that you're sharing that software with the world, so you're hosting it and running that software, then the need to share that source code again comes up. Um, so, so you know that it, that's that's still a way of building community and and for people using those services to understand how that um, how that service actually functions. Um, kind of in tandem with that is the concern uh, with JavaScript. Um, you know, JavaScript and the Java virtual machine that runs on everybody's system is increasingly powerful and capable. Um, and you know, licensing measures for that software aren't exactly uh, built in at this point. Um, there are some projects to kind of work on that, but um, and you know, there is a plugin that helps to. Uh, there's numerous plugins to help to reduce JavaScript. Um, running from your system unless it is free software. Um, but without getting into too much of that, I mean, the, the, the point I think that there is to take away is that that software is powerful. Um, and if you're using a browser on some site, you know, it is important to understand what that software does as well. Um, you know, things like uh, WASM uh, or WebAssembly, um, you know, makes that software very performant and is able to be used for many, uh, many purposes. You know, we're all familiar with the transition of, you know, word processors and spreadsheets, all our normal office software onto a, onto a web server. Um, well, in large part, that software is still running on your machine. Uh, it's just sent to your machine from a server. Um, so, you know, free software in those contexts is, is, is an important consideration as well. Um, you know, and I, I think that that gets a little bit more technical, and I don't think we really want to go there. But um, yeah. Um, anyway. And one one other just point, uh, Mickey, you can go ahead. I, I should you can you can go. Well, I was just going to quickly say yes, Chris. That's really important. <laughs> that's that's all. Just just a, a minor addendum uh, to to Chris's point there. Um, you know, just. You know, one of the one of the things about having software that is hosted on a network, especially if it has a database, right? Like, if you have a database somewhere, right? Then free software isn't going to do, you know, very much in terms of, you know, protecting any of your data on that database. There are other things that you can do, like you know, make sure that if if any of your personal data is on a database somewhere with someone, you know, you know, try to make sure that. 
I know, I know that's not always easy because there are all kinds of reasons why we need to have our, our personal data all over the place anymore. But, you know, for the most part, try, try to, you know, try to make sure that if you're using some kind of service that you trust whoever it is that you're working with, whoever's hosting the service, and, you know, try to get a sense of, um, you know, is, it, is my data going to be safe with these people on this service? Who has access to it? That is a whole conversation. Um, which we is a whole different talk that we've had before about um, you know ethical hosting providers. We're not going to go deeply into that today, <laughs> um, but it is. But that's definitely something um, a uh, an important aspect to you know if your if your any of your data is going to be on someone's server. And then another thing is you know encryption um, is you know software can use encryption to protect people's data. Um, so free software doesn't do all those things. There are other tools that we need to, you know, think about whether it's community, encryption, free software, you know, we need to pull all these resources together and think, all right, how can we strategically think about how to protect ourselves and protect the people in our community and the people that we're organizing with together? Um, I can just interject a moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just want to point out um, there are there are companies, Google being a prime example, that amass huge amounts of data on us that ostensibly do support or use open source software. And so, you know, open source software is not is is not unfortunately a guarantee that. Uh, the data that you amass is in any way in your control. Um, but, you know, having open source software that you control on your individual devices is key. Uh, the other point I want to point out is these open source projects need our support. You know, I'm thinking back to OpenSSL's Heartbleed um, vulnerability that affected so many uh, websites throughout the world. And, you know, it was two guys working on a set of software that was used by thousands, if not millions, potentially of different corporations or nonprofits or things like that. And it's important that if you're using open source software that you give back to them, either donating to them, donating your time to help them be successful or to, uh, you know, make code changes to keep the software updated, you know, this is something that's reliant on us and it's important for us as individuals to help in whatever way we can. Yep. Thanks, Jamie. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. I mean, whether it's 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 uh, an accidental bug that's in, in the, the software or it's intentional, you know, supply line poisoning of open source uh, software, there, there are definitely uh, some security challenges there. Um, not to mention, like, I mean, with uh, free software being focused on letting a user do whatever it wants, you know, there are uh, numerous very powerful free software tools that can be used for, for things that we'd rather them not be used for, too. So, um, so yeah, it's it's not all, um, it, it doesn't fix everything, as everybody said. Um, yeah, we're closing in on the last ten minutes. If you want to talk about um, things, maybe we would we would we would think might be good ideas to focus on. Or yeah, I just wanted to uh, let you know I popped the link in the chat again, and it's to the IEEE, which has a project now called SA Open, and they are starting to create standards for free software development. Um, that's something that we haven't like put in a box yet for people to uh, take it and be able to explain it to others, take it and run. Um, and I think most of our work right now is boiling down the message so that it's palatable for people who aren't as deeply invested in development as some of us are. So that's a project anyone can get involved in. You don't have to be a developer or a back-end knowledge person because we need all of us to bridge this gap. We need people who know nothing and people who know almost everything to come together and figure out where are the gaps 
where are the, where are people falling through these gaps and lacking the understanding of it and how important it is. So, and the connection of, you know, how does free software protect your privacy? And as Chris said, it doesn't do everything. And as Keegan also said, so the, the main important thing about the last uh, bit of talk is it's important to get to know your service providers. We got to get away from doing business and more back into doing life and protecting each other and protecting ourselves. Get to know the people on the other end um, that are running your server. You should know them. You, you shouldn't just, um, you know, go, oh, I'll talk to any tech about this, blah, blah, blah. Um, you should have a, a real solid connection, like more of a family thing where everyone is taking care of each other and looking out for each other in our areas of expertise. So your voice is needed no matter how little or how much you know. All right. So our, um, I, I think one of the things that we were hoping to, to focus on here was um, just certain projects that could be really helpful or ideas that could be really helpful, um, maybe potential um, like political ideas, things to, um, or um, just basically, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, one of the questions that I was thinking earlier is like, what are some of the important ways that free software can, um, can help us in the future moving forward? Um, so I had a few, a couple of ideas, um, that I had in mind, but I think, um, per, <laughs> yeah, there are lots of ideas <laughs> that, that I think we all have in mind. Um, but I think one of the things that uh, most people can agree on and, and a lot of people are, um, will say is, um, is education, right? Is if. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking like large, this is a, this is, I'm talking a large scale goal, not necessarily super low hanging fruit. And, but the thing isn't like technically it's, it's, a, it's not a very, it's not a huge goal. Like the thing, the thing is, um,